Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Welcome back. The 2016 presidential campaign never ends, does it? It won't. Well, 2050 we'll be arguing about it. But on Friday, the Democratic National Committee filed a lawsuit against the Trump campaign, the Russian government, and WikiLeaks, alleging that they engaged in a conspiracy to sabotage Hillary Clinton and help Donald Trump become president. Joining me now to discuss this development is the chair of the DNC, Tom Perez. Mr. Chairman, welcome back to the show. Always a pleasure to be back with you, Chuck. All right, let me start with um, this. Why this lawsuit right now? And I ask this because the president toys with interfering with the Mueller probe, and Democrats are quick to say, let it run its mm -hmm. course. This, to me, is a lawsuit you're making a claim that Mueller hasn't made yet. Why not wait for the Mueller probe to end before you file your lawsuit? Sure. Well, there are three basic reasons. Number one, uh, you have to file claims in a timely manner under statute of limitations. I don't know when Director Mueller's investigation is going to end, nor would I ever ask him, because I want him to do a good, thorough job. And so we need to protect our rights under the appropriate statute of limitations. When was this going to expire? How close to this deadline are well, if we? Again, I don't know when Director Mueller is going to uh, file his complaint or, or whatever action you he believe takes. You couldn't have filed a lawsuit. Well, if you again, waited a couple we, weeks. We don't know when Director Mueller is going to act. And so th this notion, and, and again, I don't want to ask him when he's going to act. And mm -hmm. so we have to protect our rights. But secondly, we've done our homework, Chuck. I, a year ago, people were saying, file a lawsuit then. And I didn't do that because I believe in doing your homework. And over the course of the last year, we have seen, I think, a mountain of evidence of collusion between the uh, campaign and the Russians to basically uh, affect our democracy and so we we did our homework and we brought our civil case and then finally I'm worried about these midterm elections because they did this with impunity uh, you know General McMaster said that uh, uh, we we haven't Im we failed to impose sufficient costs on Russia well we know why I think they failed to impose sufficient costs on Russia for this uh, dramatic and reckless and, and unprecedented hack because this administration is compromised. I want to make sure we send a very clear right. signal. I want to, I'm curious of, of who you chose to include in the lawsuit and who you didn't. You have Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, Paul Manafort, Roger Stone. You don't have Michael Flynn. He's somebody that, that's been charged. I'm curious, why is Michael Flynn not included? No Steve Bannon, no Corey Lewandowski, no Kelly and Conway, three other people who served as sort of campaign chairs or managers, but you do have Manafort. What was the decision making to go of who got in and who didn't? Well, we brought a case against the people that we feel there's sufficient evidence to move forward in a civil case. That doesn't preclude us from moving to amend the case as we discover more evidence. But you don't the think there's enough case. evidence when Michael Flynn, huh? Well, well again, uh, we want to make sure, I'm, I'm a big believer in making sure that I have confidence in every aspect of my case. And in the Watergate case that was brought by Larry O'Brien, former chair of the DNC, that complaint was amended over time. I am confident that we will file an amended complaint over time. Did Hillary and Clinton uh, push you to do this? Was this, <laughs> an, was this something that she supported? Tom, uh, you'll have to ask uh, Secretary. You don't know if she... I have, I have not consulted Hillary Clinton to ask her permission to file the complaint. The, the buck stops with Tom Perez. And I've, we filed this complaint because uh, our democracy is at risk. This was an assault on our democracy, and we have to protect that. Uh, I spoke with a legal expert on my show on Friday who said he believes under federal law that your claims, if it does come to trial, 
will they have to be decided by a judge, not a jury, that you won't get a jury trial because of the statute that you're using. Are you concerned if you don't get a jury trial? I'm confident we'll get a jury trial, and uh, we've had plenty of legal experts. So you don't believe that this is... I don't don't agree with that at all. You don't don't agree with that? All right. Let me ask you a few uh, different reactions to this. First, let me Mm -hmm. put up what uh, Donald Trump's campaign manager for 2020, Brad Parscale, said. This is a sham lawsuit about a bogus Russian collusion claim filed by a desperate, dysfunctional, and nearly insolvent Democratic Party. They've sunk to a new low to raise money, referring to this... A criticism that you guys are just doing this <laughs> to raise money. Let me ask you this: Are you using the lawsuit to raise money? No, and you know th- I'm laughing, uh, Chuck, because those are almost the precise quotes we heard from the Nixon campaign in 1972 when this was filed. We're bringing this lawsuit to seek justice, to expose the truth, and to deter future behavior. We have elections coming up. They tried to interfere. They interfered in 2016. They did it with impunity, and they're trying to do it again. And we've got to deter it. This is an attack on our democracy, and we need to. We can fight for good health care. We can fight for good jobs, and we can fight to preserve our democracy. In fact, we must do that. All right, I'm going to ask you a question that apparently came up on a conference call that you had with some mm-hmm. state party leaders. Uh, and this was from Slate. It said, I just mentioned this to a county. This is uh, referring to somebody. We don't know who it was on the call, but a state party uh, official. I just mentioned this to a county chair. And her response was, how can we spend all that money? So can you address that, the financial burden that's going to be on us? I will ask. Is this going to cost the DNC? How much money are you taking away from 2018 to focus on 2016 in Russia? Chuck, we can't afford not to do this because when you look ahead and you see what, what was done before and what they're trying to do again, our democracy is at stake. It's hard to win elections when you have interference in elections. We've been winning elections. We know how to walk and chew gum. We've got boots on the ground right now in Arizona. We have, an, we have a great candidate. She's an undeniable underdog. We're fighting there. We just won in, in uh, Wisconsin. You didn't answer. How much money is this We're, lawsuit well, going to take we, this year? It, Millions? I don't know. I don't know the uh, amount of money that it will take, but I'll tell you, it's hard to put a price tag on preserving democracy. And you know what? That's why I concluded that it would be irresponsible of me not to do this. Jackie Spear, Democrat from California, Claire McCaskill uh, office. Claire McCaskill's office called it a silly distraction, the lawsuit. Jackie Spear, uh, a Democrat who's on House Intel Committee, has seen all of this Mm -hmm. stuff, says it's ill-conceived and not in the interest of the American people. What would you tell them? I love those two uh, Democrats. They're good, great people. We're working to help reelect them. And I disagree with them for the simple reason that uh, preserving our democracy uh, is priceless. And when you have elections that have been attempted, you've seen attempted interference in the past, they're going to do it again. And by the way, uh, I would love to introduce them to some of my colleagues on the DNC. Mm-hmm. At the end of this, they were trying to bring about chaos, Chuck, okay. and they did. We had people on my team at the DNC who got death threats. And you know what? When you try to do that to our team, yeah, I'm going to punch back. I'm punching back not only for my colleagues, I'm punching back for democracy. That's what we believe in as Democrats. Elections should be fair. I understand people may agree and disagree, but you know what? We're fighting for them. Okay. Tom Perez, chair of the DNC. Thanks for coming on, sharing your views. Nice to see you, sir. Always a pleasure. It is Monday, the 23rd of April of 2018, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special, of course, is River City Hash Monday. That's right, folks. It's been a very busy weekend. You think that leftovers are leftovers, but no, it's a completely new day, folks, and a completely new menu. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know, one tries to use the same ingredients in all the dishes. You know, you might change a protein here and there, but the basics are going to be fungible. As they say in economics, yeah. Well, uh, Chuck Todd, Chuck Todd. You know, I can't call Chuck Todd sleepy eyes, because that's what the the German Nazis called the Jews in Nazi Germany, sleepy-eyed Jews. So uh, the president of the United States just used an anti-Semitic Nazi term against a uh, a, a Jewish uh, news broadcaster. But, all that aside, Chuck Todd, what the hell is up with Chuck Todd? 
He acts like he doesn't know anything. It's almost as if he doesn't know anything. But uh, that's been an accusation that's been floated for uh, even before Chuck Todd uh, became the moderator of Press the Meat. Yep, it's all about access, folks. It's all about access. Uh, Now, uh, Trump has been pilloried for not attending Barbara Bush's funeral, but of course, it's uh, not common for a president, a current president, to go to the funeral of a former first lady. On the other hand, Trump is exceedingly uncommon as a president, and I would have expected him to do the uncommon thing, but no. Uh, actually, he did do an uncommon thing, and that was during uh, the funeral. Uh, he made public pronouncements uh, about how great he is, and and he played some golf, made some more public pronouncements about how great he is, and and uh, you know, so fine. I mean, I'm not a big fan of Barbara Bush, but I even during Nixon's funeral, I didn't uh, you know make a bunch of myself, and I hated Nixon. I I organized the with my best friend John Koenig chauffeur we organized the uh, first impeach Nixon rally uh, on the west coast well certainly west of uh, Michigan because uh, Ann Arbor I believe was when the first impeach Nixon rally <laughs> occurred I hate the term rally we called ours a teach-in but uh, that doesn't flow off the tongue as well as rally impeach Nixon rally and uh uh, I, I despise that fellow for many reasons. And um, uh, even during his funeral, I, you know, I I actually had uh, a bit of an argument with my then fiance, my my who then became my wife, uh, the French actress that I mentioned on occasion. Uh, she didn't have a visceral memory, of course, of Nixon. You know, so, oh, and I had to explain, you know, what Nixon had done and why he had engendered such uh, disdain. Now, uh, Barbara Bush, uh, you know, she was a blue blood, uh, you know, uh, uh, didn't really have much good to say about poor people. Uh, you know, she would make offhand remarks, uh, you know, like a, an older Marie Antoinette would have made. And... Um, so, yeah, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of Barbara Bush, but, you know, during her funeral, probably, you know, it wasn't wise to do to do the things that Donald Trump was wont to do because he is Donald Trump. OK, what's <laughs> what are we going to attend to today in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Well... Montana Democratic House candidate John Heenan is buying up airtime on stations owned by Trump-friendly Sinclair Broadcasting and using it to blast Sinclair Broadcasting. Very smart fellow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, look, when it really gets down to it, money doesn't talk. Money swears. Ooh, New Jersey Republicans went broke throwing a doomed fundraiser at Trump's golf club. They thought they were going to get a lot more money because a lot more people were going to show up. Hmm, I wonder why they didn't. And the New York Times still cannot admit it botched a major Trump story from before the election. I thought they were good at, at admitting the mistakes. At least, you know, maybe buried deep inside the paper. They would do that, but no, no, no. After the break, we move to the chef's table to examine the record profits that the big banks are raking in thanks to Trump's supposedly middle-class tax cuts. Yeah. And the ancient Greek tragedies have much to teach us about James Comey's character. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. If you uh, look to the right-ish of the page, you will notice the chat room link. Kelly Lincoln, our roaring girl, monitors that quite diligently throughout the day. So if you have any concerns, requests, etc., cetera, uh, that is a good way to connect with us. Um, and uh, to the leftish of the chat room link at the bottom of the homepage at netrootsradio.com are the contribute donate buttons. And thank you uh, for your generosity in uh, contributing to our cause here. It uh, helps us pay our bills, and really, we're unable to do this without you, so thank you very much. Uh, follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. Uh, we also are also on Facebook, and uh, Tom takes care of Twitter, and uh, I think sometimes Tom and Kelly take care of the Facebook page. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. And also I post uh, the show notes and links and some other uh, tidbits of entertainment value on my diary at Daily Co's. And I'm on Daily Co's as Justice Putnam. It is indeed my real name. Podcasts of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy can be had by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes, and wherever fine podcasts can be found. Right alongside the not-so-fine ones, too, because that's the way it works. But we're there. And, uh, oh, and thank you for the downloads and uh, the plays. I appreciate it. I guess what I should also be requesting is uh, go rate or review or write something on the different platforms. If you're on iTunes, do whatever you're supposed to do there. If you're on Stitcher, do whatever you're supposed to do there. Spreaker. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for doing that. Okay. Okay, first article here that we're going to attend to at the in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays is by, I love this woman. She is such a great writer and investigator, Carolyn Orr. John Hena, oh, and she, of course she, she writes out of Share Blue Media. John Heenan, a Democratic candidate for Montana's U.S. House seat, found a clever way to get the word out about Sinclair Broadcasting Group's Orwellian tactics, and he's using the company's own airwaves to do it. <laughs> I like it. You know, how how if you, you know, go to certain websites, you know, maybe Daily Co's or any of them, and, and you and and you don't uh, like contribute or you don't uh, have a way of blocking the ads. And you notice like, God, how can a liberal group like this have the kind of ads that are on the side, you know, sidebars? How? <laughs> and it's because generally, you know, the website that you're reading has no control over those ads. So I just think it's grand that, uh, you know, Sinclair Broadcasting has uh, a way of raising money and that's by selling ads. And uh, I don't know. I just, I it, it, it just, it's, it's turnabout as fair play. Now, Heenan is buying airtime on stations owned by Sinclair to run ads slamming the Trump-friendly corporate broadcasting group for, quote, using its power to take advantage of journalists, our democracy, and the people of Montana. Because he's from Montana. Not very many people there, I gotta tell you. Sinclair came under fire recently when it was revealed that the company was forcing local reporters around the country to read a script echoing Trump's fake news mantra. Uh, Sinclair Broadcasting is probably more uh, uh, correctly defined as Trump TV than Fox because Sinclair Broadcasting uh, went into an actual agreement with uh, the Trump organization. Uh, one of the Trump sons touted the partnership. And now it's Trump TV for all intents and purposes. While many Democratic candidates have pulled their ads from Sinclair stations, Heenan decided to go a different route. Instead of boycotting the right-wing propaganda outfit, he's using the company's own airwaves against it. Well, as soon as they find out, we'll see what happens. Either he's going to not be allowed to buy those ads anymore, because he didn't notice the sign right above, you know, the uh, the clerk where it says we reserve the right to refuse service to anyone. You dirty hippie. Get out of here, you black person and Hispanic. You foreigner, refugee terrorist. Get out. 
He didn't see that sign. Or they'll just re rebut his ads, which, you know, I guess you could. Why not? This station is owned by Sinclair Broadcasting, he says in the ad, a powerful corporation that forces its journalists to read corporate talking points on the air. Heena told the AP, that's the Associated Press, don't tell anyone I said their name, that he's running the ads to show support for Sinclair employees who may not be able to use their own voices to speak out against the corporation and and to raise awareness about what is happening. You know, one thing about Sinclair is that they have a uh, like a farm team that they draw off of from these journalism schools like Arizona State. And I would probably think USC, though, that I think USC goes to probably a higher grade of uh, uh, media uh, when they're intern when their students uh, go on to becoming interns. So these small market stations, I mean, this is the classic way of getting into the biz and moving in the biz is that you move around all these small market stations when you're in your, you know, early 20s and however long it takes. And some people really find that the area they're in is quite nice and they just stay there for a while. But for the most part, the employees, whether in production or talent, uh, they move around a lot. Talent more than production. But when you're young and you're an intern, you want to get paid. And so you put in your time, and those people are not going to say anything about Sinclair Broadcasting until after they're out. And there's been some horrendous testimonials from people who have gone through the Sinclair Broadcasting Group's uh, internship or or as uh, paid employees for a number of years who have moved on. And uh, the stories they tell are, well, it's a propaganda outfit now, isn't it? Sinclair has, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Sinclair has long been known as a miserable place to work and has only gotten worse in recent years as the company has massively expanded its reach and started forcing stations across the country to run its right-wing propaganda, among other things. Sinclair has forced local stations to air commentaries by former Trump campaign staffer Boris Epstein. You know Boris from Russia? Oh, there's no Russian connection there. I, I See, I don't get it. It is just so obvious. Now, I guess I could make the jokes about, you know, the, the Soviet bloc wives. Eh, you know, not, not counting uh, uh, the, the American model one. But, you know, Marla Maples. Not counting her. That was a little fling, but they brought him back in the fold. You know, okay? And it's it's a wonder that Tiffany is kind of left out of all this because, you know, she's really not part of the family, which is the Russian family, the Russian side of the family. So, I mean, one could make jokes like we did back in the day, like, wow, he sure has a lot of uh, Soviet bloc wives. Wonder what that's all about. Uh, so uh, now you got Boris. Boris, I, where's Nas- Where's Nastasha? I don't know. I think she's doing her uh, her work, you know, clandestinely. The Russian uh, version of the Avengers. Okay. Among other things, Sinclair has forced those (laughs) stations to run Boris Epstein, including one in which he defended Trump's reaction to white supremacist violence after it received nationwide condemnation. And Sinclair also forces local stations to air xenophobic terror terror alert desk segments designed to gin up support for Trump's bigoted policies. Now, the worst part about Sinclair's propaganda is not its reach or right-wing bias, but its insidious method of obscuring its bias by packaging the coverage as local news while not revealing the source. They have, like, infomercial news, but they never say that it's infomercial news. And some people uh, can't tell the difference. I don't know. I always can. But thanks to Heenan, residents of Montana will know exactly what they're getting when they tune in to their local Sinclair-owned propaganda channels, unless the feed somehow gets disrupted like happens on MSNBC. Do you ever notice that? 
it buffers right when you're, you know, like some important thing is being said. Is that just me? Sismar from Ross Story penned this uh, next piece. Here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, the Republican Party in Morris County, New Jersey, is broke after losing money in a doomed from fundraiser at Trump National Golf Club. Republicans tried to drum up attendance by teasing the idea that Trump would show up as a surprise guest. <laughs> they even, get this, he even asked uh, a, a attendees, registered attendees for social security numbers just to make it appear that, you know, maybe the Secret Service was going to, you know, give him security clearances and that Trump was actually going to be visiting. And he was at the time golfing at Mar-a-Lago for President's Day holiday weekend when this occurred. Now, the county party now has just a little less than 14000 bucks heading into the June election. And that's uh, according to the New Jersey Election Law Enforcement Commission. They had raised 58000 almost 58500 at the Trump event, but spent $64,000 to host it. Ouch. And they paid 24000 I'm sorry, almost 25000 to the Trump National Golf Club. And also paid Fox News funny man Greg Guckfeld a $30,000 speaking fee. And they're whining about Hillary speaking fees? Give me a break. So uh, this is one of a number of spendy fundraisers, such as a Yankee Stadium event where they spent $5,700 for two ex-Yankee players to show up. they got to pay them. All right. So uh, last year, State Senator Anthony Bucco got 52% of the vote and almost lost to a Democrat in the last election. And the party outside New York has been a Republican stronghold for centuries. Democrats haven't held a elected uh, haven't elected a county clerk since the Civil War, but that may change as Republicans there struggle with a lack of funds and various legal problems. up here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays, is an article by Cody Fenwick out of Alternet. Eight days before the 2016 presidential election, the New York Times ran a story throwing cold waters on the burgeoning conspiracy theorists who, who uh, with this headline that read, Investigating Donald Trump? FBI sees no clear link to Russia. Now, as we now know, that story was deeply misleading and inaccurate. But the Times has still not addressed how I got things so wrong. The story notes that the FBI had started an investigation into potential collusion between Russia and the Trump campaign be, uh, during the summer of 2016. But it says there was no conclusive or direct link between Mr. Trump and the Russian government. But we now know that the probe began with a pretty definitive link. Trump campaign staffer George Papadopoulos made contact with a man claiming to be a Russian agent who said he had hacked emails related to Hillary Clinton. The story also claimed that while the Russians were trying to interfere in the 2016 election, 
The FBI did not believe the Russians were trying to help Trump. However, FBI former, F- former FBI Director James Comey said in an interview with The New Yorker, the Bureau had already concluded that the Kremlin wanted Trump to win. Uh, Dean Baquet, the executive editor of the Times, told the Washington Post, I think the headline was off, but if you read the story, I think it was not inaccurate based on what we knew at the time. But the story was inaccurate, as we now know, and the Times would be willing and should be willing to own up to that fact. The paper continually does extraordinary reporting, and it has produced many essential stories as the Trump-Russia saga has unfolded. Utilizing anonymous sources is a difficult business, and yet the Times frequently employs them to great effect. But errors in this kind of reporting are inevitable, and when they happen, it's the paper's responsibility to explain why they happened and what went wrong. And I would just remind folks two words. Judith Miller. That's what goes wrong. Okay, let's go to our break, and we'll come back, go through weather from around the world, and then we'll finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea... To the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Next time you find yourself at a karaoke bar, let me suggest a song. Otis Redding's Sitting on the Dock of the Bay. The reason? It's got whistling in it. So you'll sound better, because new research out in the journal Royal Society Open Science says it's easier to accurately whistle a melody than it is to sing it. And this is a bit of a surprise because, I mean, we spend all day uh, using our our voices. Most of the time it's for speech, but we do all kinds of really subtle and interesting things with speech. Michelle Bellick is a neuroscientist at the Holland Blue Review Kids Rehabilitation Hospital in Ontario, Canada. So as I'm speaking now, I'm placing emphasis on certain words or stress in certain syllables. You can tell that I'm making a statement rather than asking a question by the inflection of my voice. Um, and so these are all very subtle uses of the voice that we have tons and tons of practice with, much more so probably than whistling. And yet, people were a little better with the whistle. For the study, Bellick and his team asked 28 undergrads with varying levels of music and singing experience to imitate a melody like this. by either whistling or singing. And the singing was more consistently out of tune, regardless of musical level. Michelle's theory on that? So what I think is going on here is, even though we don't practice whistling quite so much, uh, we have a much longer evolutionary history of having really fine green control over the muscles of the lips. Whereas... Control of the larynx is mostly evolved after humans split from other primates. So next time you feel like you're really nailing that rendition of Bohemian Rhapsody, just imagine how good you'd sound if you whistled. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Why do innocent people end up in prison, and how many of them are there? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. John Grisham, the author and a member of the board of directors of the Innocence Project, recently wrote a Los Angeles Times piece adapted from his introduction to the book The Cadaver King and the Country Dentist, a true story of injustice in the American South. There, Grisham says that the rate of wrongful convictions firmly believed by those involved in exoneration is between 2 and 10 percent of all the people in American prisons. And there are 2.3 million of them. So we're talking between 46,000 and 230,000 innocent people locked up behind bars in America today. The reasons the innocent are convicted? Bad defense lawyering, jailhouse snitches, false confessions. 
particularly those induced by abusive police interrogations, false eyewitness IDs, junk science, and also sleeping judges, and prosecutorial misconduct, and bad police, sometimes negligent, sometimes falsified police work, and institutional racism. Grisham points out, quote, that the atrocities aren't specific to one time and place. The medical examiners, police officers, prosecutors, judges, and others who hold sway over our criminal justice system around the country have largely failed to deliver justice. We must, he says, do better. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. And this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1937. That was the day workers at the Hershey Candy Plant in Hershey, Pennsylvania, sat down. CIO organizers for the new United Chocolate Workers Union reported that anywhere from 2,000 to 2,400 workers were on strike. Hershey was a company town where streets were named Chocolate and Coca Avenue. Housing was built for workers and the company funded public education and transit service. But the company also sought to monitor and control workers' behavior on their off time and showed favoritism in hiring and wages. The Great Depression created dire conditions even in the sweetest place on earth. Hours and bonuses had been cut. Workers grew increasingly frustrated with production speed up and unpredictable work schedules, all while Hershey still drew handsome profits. The company initially raised wages after meeting with the union, but then laid off the organizers three months later. That's when the workers shut off their machines and occupied the plant. The company refused to negotiate unless the workers left. By April 7th, dairy farmers became incensed at the loss of income. They mobilized with anti-union company forces to storm the factory and drive the strikers out. Organizers had agreed to end the strike in order to resume negotiations and avert violence. But the anti-union forces attacked the sit-downers with bats, whips, clubs, and hammers. Three CIO organizers were singled out and severely beaten. Governor George Earl condemned the attack and blamed the county sheriff for suppressing labor rather than preventing mob rule. The strike was smashed. Attempts to install a company union failed soon after. Hershey would be one of the first candy companies to be organized when the Bakery, Confectionery, Tobacco Workers, and Grain Millers International Union won recognition two years later. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor report recorded on Monday, April 23rd, 2018. I'm Mark Belanger. Trade unions around the world are facing enormous challenges such as an aging workforce, a lack of decent jobs, and automation. In Singapore, the labor movement is addressing these issues by adopting an overall tripartite policy. Tripartism is the institutionalized cooperation of governments, employers, and labor unions. I talked to to Patrick Tay about Singapore and tripartism. Mr. Tay is the executive secretary of the Singapore Manual and Mercantile Workers Union, the SMMWU. He is also an Assistant General Secretary of the National Trades Union Congress of Singapore, the NTUC. I asked Mr. Tay to describe the challenges facing the Singaporean labor force and the practice of government, employer, and labor union tripartism. Firstly, the aging workforce. One in four of our workers will be above 65 years of age come 2030. The second big challenge is actually structural unemployment. Although we have jobs and uh, we have people looking for jobs, uh, there is still unemployment because of a mismatch of skills, uh, jobs as well as expectations. And the third big issue that we are facing and or challenge, I would say, is the digital disruption that we are seeing with rapid change in technology, automation, mechanization, robotization, as well as um, in many of the new developments in, in the sphere of uh, artificial intelligence or even machine learning is affecting many sectors, many industries, many businesses and companies. And it's impacted workers because uh, jobs are becoming obsolete and uh, more jobs are facing risk. So these are the three big problems. And so how, how has NTUC and our SMMWU been uh, working on or been embarking on? I think there's, there's a few key things. In Singapore, we have a unique tripartite relationship between the union and the government and employers, and then we work quite closely. 
In fact, just recently, we completed rolling out the industry transformation maps for 23 different sectors uh, across the entire economy. And uh, what, what's pivotal about this is that if we are looking at what are the future jobs, uh, future skills, future training that is needed for NTUC as well as uh, all our various unions and our workers. And, and the key thing is to how do we make sure no one is left behind? You mentioned that in Singapore, there is a tripartite arrangement between the government, employer groups, and labor unions. Can you tell us a bit more about this tripartism? Uh, in Singapore, we have a unique, a uniquely Singapore kind of a tripartite relationship where the government, uh, in this case, the Ministry of Manpower, and, uh, and of course, uh, the workers represented by the National Trade Union Congress, as well as our affiliated unions, such as my union, SNMWU, as well as the Employer Federation, which is the uh, trade unions for the employers. I think we work very closely. The 23 industry transformation maps for the different sectors, which I talked about earlier, they are powered by committees. We call them tripartite committees, where people like myself, union leaders, government officials, as well as employers, sit on the various tripartite committees to roll these, these plans or these roadmaps for all these 23 industries. So there's a lot of union involvement. Because uh, government supports through funding, employers play a very important role because whether how the businesses uh, innovate, stay ahead and stay competitive and make money, and that's the employer's job. But on the union's part, our role is to encourage workers and to, uh, to work with them that journey in embracing some of these changes and uh, the, the changes that lie ahead. I understand that you are a chess master. Do you see any parallels between chess and collective bargaining? I'm not a chess master. It's just that I picked up chess along the way in school. Well, chess in many ways uh, have, I would say, similarities with collective bargaining. In chess, strategy is very important. How you plan ahead, how you size up your opponents. Uh, In this case, in collective bargaining, the employers and businesses uh, negotiating and strategizing every move so that we can get a deal for our workers. And that's it. International Labour News you can use. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Labour. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. From New York, I'm Luke Vargas with your World in Two Minutes. Earlier this week, Think Progress reported that the African affiliate of the conservative Christian group Focus on the Family had received a $50,000 grant from the State Department to teach an abstinence curriculum known as No Apologies to South African teenagers. That taxpayer-funded grant is part of U.S. government efforts to combat HIV-AIDS. According to Focus on the Family, the No Apologies curriculum emphasizes the value of the individual, marriage, the family, and the importance of keeping oneself pure till marriage. But a major survey published by Stanford researchers in 2016 found abstinence programs funded by the U.S. government in the last decade didn't even hit the milestones their proponents commonly cite. So we looked at age at first marriage, we looked at age of first sexual intercourse. Iran Ben David is an associate professor of medicine at Stanford's School of Medicine. The results were pretty straightforward. There was not a significant change between the countries where the money was provided and where the money wasn't. And there wasn't really a significant change over time. In fact, these social phenomenon were mostly stable over the period that we were looking at. Ben David said that while abstinence education aims to change certain behaviors, like whether an individual has sex before marriage, Public health experts focus on very different targets, like whether individuals engage in high-risk sexual behavior or needle sharing. And if those are the goals, Ben David says there's ample evidence promoting circumcision among boys and men and distributing pre-exposure prophylactics is a much better intervention than abstinence programs. If it looks like the policy is not effective, then that money is likely to be better spent elsewhere. And continuing to spend money on ineffectual programs is in some ways harm because there's money lost and that, that money is relatively scarce. The State Department did not respond to a request to provide evidence showing the effectiveness of government-funded abstinence programs in reducing HIV transmission. Luke Vargas, New York.
Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. River City Hash Mondays is our daily special. Music is provided uh, uh, here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The music is provided by Frances Livings, and uh, she is an ingenue and uh, great artist, performer, uh, down in Southern California. And I failed to mention that she had a show on Saturday, the 21st. But she does have some upcoming shows. She's going to be at Genghis Cohen in Los Angeles at 7 p.m. on this Friday, the 27th. And then the Friday after that, May 4th, she'll be at the Urban Press Winery in Burbank at 8 p.m. And uh, mark your calendars. All right. So let's uh, go ahead and get in into weather from around the world. And we always begin along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 43 degrees. And uh, we had some really nice weather over the weekend. It was in the mid-70s. And now we inch up into the deadly weather, the potential deadly weather. The one in which we will have to use copious amounts of water coming out of the tap rather than that falling from the sky. Because we're going to be in the low 80s today. And it looks like uh, as the days go on, we will be inching ever irrevocably up to the mid 80s. Which means it could be even warmer where I'm at. Though there is a forecast of respite towards the end of the week, it looks like showers on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So we'll keep our fingers crossed for that. Temperatures should come down a tad when that happens. But uh, fortunately, I've got, uh, I think, most everything uh, planted in terms of the edibles. I have a couple of ornamentals and uh, complementary uh, specimens that I need to put into the garden and elsewhere around the, the property, which is quite parkland right now. I got the picnic tables out, got the umbrellas up, uh, put out uh, various chairs and and, uh, opened up the gazebo. So, uh, yeah, it's a little park here in Rogue River. All right. Weather from around. Oh, I failed to mention. Uh, Air quality is good at eight parts per million. Good for now. Pressure is rising at 30.14 inches. High pressure is dominating, by the way. Visibility is up to 10 miles and humidity is 68%. A precipitous drop from what humidity had been previous. Oh, grass pollen is high. I hope I don't sneeze from that. Usually it's when people are burning their trash. They do that here. It's so stupid. So stupid. Okay. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people live around the world. London is 60 degrees and mostly cloudy. Paris is 69 and partly cloudy. Roma is 75 and sunny. Oh, my. Kiev is 62 and fair. Kabul is 71 and fair. Hong Kong is 74 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 60 degrees and cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 64 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 51 degrees and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 56 degrees Fahrenheit. And springtime sunny abounds. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these personal weather stations that they purchased somewhere on their property. And these people live around the world. First article here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays, is another article by Cody Fenwick out of Alternet. Ah, guess what? Republicans misled voters about what their uh, tax cut bill would actually do. I'm shocked. 
When Donald Trump and the Republican Party pitched their bill to overhaul the American tax code, they promised voters that their plan was a middle class tax relief bill. As the law goes into effect, though, most Americans are seeing a little benefit while the big banks are raking in record profits. According to a new analysis, six big Wall Street banks made an additional $3.59 billion so far this year thanks to the tax law. Now, this was a report or an analysis by the Associated Press. I would have said an additional, instead of an additional $3.59 billion, I would have said an almost Three hundred and sixty billion dollars. What's this three hundred and fifty nine? It makes it sound like it's not as bad. Financial analyst James Shanahan told the AP if there was one significant factor quarter for the big banks that I follow, it was taxes. This is no surprise. The tax law was designed mainly to slash taxes for businesses, dropping the corporate tax rate from thirty five to twenty one percent. The bill also cut individual tax rates, but those changes benefit the rich. Yep. Meanwhile, health insurance costs continue to rise, which can easily wipe out the meager wage increases middle and low income people may get from the tax law. Did you like that 25 cents that you got? That's about what you got. If that. At a time of growing inequality and the rising power of corporations, the GOP decided to take the tax code and skew it even more toward those who already have a disproportionate share of wealth in the society. Record profits from the banks are only the most recent evidence of this change. Well, well, actually, I've seen the advertisements about uh, this wealth inequality, and rather than get mad at all those people in first class, figure out a way to join them. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Last article here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is by Victoria Pagan out of the conversation. Now that's an Australian paper, just so you know. Once upon a time, there was a prominent, powerful man in government who cared deeply about integrity and following the rules. He said, you cannot know a man completely, his character, his principles, sense of judgment, not till he's shown his colors. Experience, there's the test. Leaders have a sacred obligation to those they rule, he said, as I see it, whoever refuses to adopt the soundest policies, but fearing someone keeps his lips locked tight He's utterly worthless. The responsibility to act with integrity extended to others in leadership. He believed he could never stand by silent, nor could I ever make that man a friend of mine who menaces our country. Such are my standards. You can imagine uh, reading those sentiments in James Comey's new memoir, A Higher Loyalty, Truth, Lies, and Leaderships, Leadership, a book that is provoking a spectrum of responses. But... Those words are actually excerpts from a translation of Creon's first speech in Sophocles' Antigone, written almost 2,500 years ago. Now, the author of this article is a professor of classics who studies the literature of the ancient Mediterranean world. In the wake of the publication of Comey's memoir and under the current president in general, she believes there is a case to be made for reading the ancient Greek tragedies not just because they shed light into some of human nature's darker corners, but because the practice may even help us find common ground in our fractured political climate. 
Now, uh, without or at, at at the risk of sounding very old school, which in many ways I am, I think that uh, well grounding in uh, the classics is a good thing, not a bad thing. I I am not uh, advocating only the classics, mind you. But uh, I don't know. Give your kid Plutarch's Lives before you give him Harry Potter. Just, 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 just me. Just me. Not to say that Harry Potter is bad. But to understand Harry Potter, you might want to sta- understand the Greek tragedies, too. Maybe first. For some, Comey's book only pours salt in the wounds of the so-called October surprise. That's when Comey, then the director of the FBI, announced that the investigation of Clinton's emails was reopened. Comey insists that in his position, he had the awesome task of adopting the soundest policies without fear of retribution. For the sake of the country, he could not stand by or keep silent. For others, the memoir provides ample evidence that Trump is morally unfit to be president. Comey is no friend of a president who menaces our country, echoing Creon's Such Are My Standards. Now, Creon's tragic story begins after the downfall of King Oedipus, when the rule of Oedipus's city, Thebes, fell to his two sons, Eteocles and Polynices, who were supposed to hold joint command. Eteocles, however, refused to share the ruling of Thebes with his brother, or Thebes with his brother, so Polynices gathered an army of allies and attacked the city in an aggressive act of civil war and fratricide. Both brothers were killed, leaving their uncle Creon to inherit the troubled kingship. Creon issued an edict that only Eteocles could receive an honorable burial. The body of the aggressor, Polynices, should be left to rot. Antigone, sister of both dead men, defied the edict and paid minimal funeral rites to her brother, Polynices, because she believed that the laws of the gods outweighed all human laws. For her disobedience, Creon, who lived by rigid rules, condemned her to death. He is ultimately convinced to change his mind, but not before Antigone commits suicide along with her fiancé, Haman, Creon's son, and Haman's mother, Creon's wife. Well, Creon learned his lesson too late. In spite of the obvious differences between Creon and Comey, the comparison with Greek tragedy, while not exact, is illuminating. Both men appear to share the same tragic flaw, an unbending adherence to principles. Both men believe they are acting in the best interest of their community. Both men align their words and deeds, and in their actions they reveal their character and the actions of both men have unintended consequences. Both men can be defended for upholding the rule of law. Both men can be condemned for causing harm to fellow citizens. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But we'll visit with you tomorrow, of course, for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Stay tuned to Netroots Radio for the rest of the day. Uh, live content uh, from our national feed will be uh, occurring all day, starting with Hartman and uh, going through uh, Malloy tonight. And uh, any breaking news will be breaking there. And if the big news comes down, uh, Netroots Radio will be going live with a quite extensive panel of uh, luminaries from the blogosphere and beyond to uh, deconstruct it with you, and we'll talk you through it. So stay tuned to Netroots Radio, and we will visit with you tomorrow in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière. 
comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère. T'as mangé d'un hiver. Ma robe à fleurs sous la pluie de novembre. Tes mains qui coulent, je n'en peux plus de t'attendre. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire T'en manges à d'un d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au langue de golf clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts T'en manges à d'un d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 